uh, work for a company that's really relatively, um, uh, well, no, is, is very high in the, in the philanthropic kind of any way you judge companies and how they work and so on. GSK has a lot of um, activity in the, uh, traditionally, he's worked in malaria for over 100 years, um, the, the good and bad things of halophantrin and um, pyrimethamine and a number of other drugs like malarone came out of the, the GSK or what are called the legacy companies. Um, and you'll have heard of the RTSS vaccine, which is worked on by colleagues of mine who, who live and work mainly in Belgium in the big vaccines campus there. Um, and um, about uh, four or five years ago, I've, I found myself um, working on um, a, 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 um, a Vivax drug um, which is um, similar to primaquin in that it stops um, a relapse. And um, <clears throat> the interesting thing about Vivax, besides being the poorer co cousin of um, falciparum, both in terms of the clinical effects and how serious people perceive it to be as a, as a disease acutely, um, is that if you're really good, um, you saw already uh, education leads to better um, attendance at outpatients and... and um, uh, uh, you know, having a better GDP essentially means you're very good at um, uh, getting rid of P. falciparum. But one of the things you can't uh, get rid of then is that kind of nagging and growing in terms of proportionally problem of Vivax in uh, areas where you might want your communities to, um, to have better health. Um, so I'll, I'll talk about um, uh, uh, what is felt to be a, a neglected um, tropical disease um, um, the, 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 the enlarged red, cell, red cells with these fleshy trophozoites and Schiffenstotts and so on um, um, in, in t talking about Vivax, which has increasingly become a, a disease of interest to uh, um, both politicians and health, uh, um, health uh, um, ministries and so on because of the persistent problem that that has when you're trying to eliminate stroke eradicate and that's very much driven by the Gates declaration a few years ago which has really set the political and financial agenda for, for what's being done. So for those of you that, that, that have forgotten, um, some of you that, that probably know better than me, um, of course um, sporozoites give you that early liver stage and then you get down here the, uh, the blood stage which gives you symptoms. Um, but uh, you get these hypnozoites, these sleeping cells in the liver. Um, they are probably formed very early in disease um, after the sporozoites um, cross the liver. Um, and um, that's about as much as we know about Vivax malaria. It's a really difficult um, disease to study because there aren't very good animal models. Uh, it's not traditionally been, been studied particularly well unless you... Uh, um, are interested in the 1930s literature on malaria therapy where people with tertiary syphilis were deliberately infected with um, malaria because the high fever was very good at k killing central nervous system treponemes. Um, but, but really we know very, very little about this, the biology of this. It's not really very easy to image it and, and so on and so forth. So that means that what we're trying to do is we're kind of feeling our way in the dark and doing a bit of science at the same time as drug development. And that's not usually how companies like to, to work. They like to work in areas uh, where the understanding of disease and mechanisms of disease is well understood because that allows you then to drop in the expertise of drug um, development, drug discovery development into that kind of setting and makes your chance of success much higher. But, but this is what we do. Uh, uh, um, uh, well, eight eight, eight or, or nine years ago, um, Tofenequin was in a bit of a hiatus uh, this drug was originally discovered at the Walter Reed in the US and the interaction between defense spending and malaria and, and things and business and health center is, is very, very uh, complicated when you get into the weeds of, 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 of the way the world works. But, um, so, so massive discovery on A-taminoquinolines, which is this structure here, that's the A-taminoquinoline um, um, uh, uh, basic structure, uh, based out of the fact that primaquin was uh, developed um, in the 1950s but has always had this issue of causing um, hemolysis. Particularly it was noted in uh, American, black American GIs in, uh, originally in Korea and then in Vietnam. And indeed um, 
it's actually Perimaquin that drove the discovery of G6PD deficiency rather than um, understanding it the other way around. Uh, and at that point, um, very little had been done with this drug. Um, it had failed in a number of phase three studies, not, not really because of efficacy, a little bit between study design. It's easy to be retrospective, but it was kind of hanging around. When companies merge or divest, stuff stops happening, people stop making decisions, and, and at that point there were other competing interests for the portfolio that we were working on at the time. But it was noted that in a couple of studies done in Thailand, um, that, that either monotherapy with what we now know is a pretty large dose of tofenoquin, or in combination with chloroquine, um, actually was really very effective at, um, uh, actually it can treat uh, Vivax, both the blood stage and the hypnozoites on its own, um, but in combination with chloroquine, a fast-acting schizonticidal that really gets rid of your symptoms probably almost quicker than paracetamol does in terms of getting rid of the fever and rigors and so on. Um, you noted that, um, that, that the drug seemed to have very good anti-relapse efficacy and um, it's got an incredibly long half-life um, and it's probably not metabolised particularly uh, very much from this basic structure here. That is primaquin, and you just add on these two bits. It's very highly protein bound and is uh, an incredibly effective um, anti relapse um, drug. So we had to then design um, a series of studies to get us to where we are at the moment. We're at the moment, we're in phase three pivotal efficacy and safety studies. Um, and uh, our biggest problem is, is G6PD deficiency. So uh, a quick genetics uh, reminder for you. Um, males only have, uh, uh, there's a bit missing here uh, in the male chromosome uh, uh, in terms of the sex chromosomes. Therefore, males for things like colour blindness and, and G6PD only have one copy of the gene and therefore they can only ever have the protein from that one, um, the, the, from the transcription of that, that one particular gene. Whereas uh, females can um, either be homozygous for two normal genes, homozygous for two deficient genes. Um, or heterozygous. So, so men are all or none uh, and women are more complicated. Um, uh, you're laughing, I'm not laughing. Uh, and, and if you add into that this, this condition of lionization, which is X chromosome in, inactivation, it explains why women with the same genotype, so, uh, and I'm mainly talking about heter heterozygous women now, um, have different levels of risk to hemolysis and actually have a different phenotype in terms of the assay that you do. And if you ever ask for a G6PD um, test in the laboratory at your hospital, uh, then it's actually a phenotypic assay that you will get back. So it's the actually literally, you know, breaking the egg and, and seeing what kind of egg is inside there. So you break the red cells and look. It really is a biochemical uh, analysis of how well that, um, uh, that red blood cell sample that you sent to the lab actually changes G6P into, into the downstream um, uh, metabolites. Uh, and, and therefore, because of X inactivation, m most people, their red cell population, and remember there's, there's very little except a bag of hemoglobin in there, um, will either have um, a deficient uh, 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 expression of um, um, a G6PD or completely normal. So they don't have what you'd think is a racemic mix that you see with, um, with somatic mutations. Individual cells are either fully deficient or, or fully normal and therefore individual cells are then fully susceptible to hemolysis or not. So what you're getting is a 50% in terms of the activity is that 50% of those red cells can still hemolyze and that's the, the problem for us um, is that when we look back and historically this is um, what we've seen in a number of studies, but this is uh, a more recent study whereby we saw an um, a Afro-American woman with a pretty precipitous drop in terms of absolute from just above uh, 11 down to just about between 8 and 9. Um, actually really asymptomatic, and this woman's in a phase 1 unit where they're asking every day, have you got symptoms, how are you feeling, what are you doing, um, um, but a pretty... Um, a noticeable decline in hemoglobin. We had two of these individuals in this study, uh, Flick in bilirubin and um, a clearly a reticulocyte count. So very much biochemically and hematologically this woman has hemolyzed in response to this and um, through um, 
uh, using what's called pharmacogenetic sample, that is the woman had agreed for her sample to be used for any um, genetics test uh, whatsoever that we thought. Um, so a very open-ended consent form, we were able to show that that individual had a variant called Santa Maria and <coughs> all of the variants for G6PD are, 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 are geographical. And um, she had uh, back calculated about, about 64, 65% activity. And so that, that meant that we were kind of had this drug, we knew that it worked very well, we knew it had this uh, liability, uh, that's very explainable, it's a very uh, well-recognized pharmacogenetic um, issue. Um, but it does mean that then um, what you have to do is uh, then design a series of experiments, essentially, which are clinical trials, uh, in order to get through an understanding of that uh, to allow you then to... Um, uh, develop the drug in a safe way, register it, and so on. So I'm, I'm not quite sure how many of you really understand why you can prescribe kefiroxime, keftraxone, um, paracetamol, any, anything on, um, on a drug chart, whether you reflect on that next time you, you write the drug chart out. But um, th there's an incredible amount of work that goes um, in the background, and, and this is a very, very simple what's called clinical development plan that we've um, hatched for the drug that we work on. It's tight, it's, it's lean, um, it's relatively cheap. It's certainly very cheap compared to um, a number of studies in asthma and things like that that, that I'm, I'm well aware of the cost of. Um, and so uh, to, to chunk it out, if you will, I'll tell you a little bit about the left-hand side, which is you have to understand the hemolytic profile of this drug, but you also have to understand that dose um, which is efficacious, so one is the safety side, uh, the other side is, is does it work and is that actually compatible with um, the fact that you're going to be dishing it out in villages with very little health infrastructure. I think actually the pictures that Ewan showed you of the, the room with two chairs or, or the other is, is very, com very compatible to places where, where, you get, um, where you get these kind of diseases. Um, but the company that I work for is very much based around you know, developing drugs within pharmacovigilance systems and yellow cards that are in the back of the BNF, and those two things are, are, are not necessarily massively compatible when you have a safety liability, so you have to try and work out, work your way through that. So I'll take you through the left-hand side and come back to the, to the right-hand side. Um, but uh, suffice to say, this is a, a pr pretty simplified version of, of what we spend our time doing currently. So... Um, so, uh, as I said, the, 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 this is a stylized, stylized drawing, but, but what you could say is that um, that enzyme activity, so um, whereby men will be at this end or at this end, um, will cause so susceptibility to hemolysis being high in pure, completely deficient males or homozygous deficient females, large amounts of red cell mass loss in those individuals, black urine, transfusion and so on and we know that's the case because we've seen that sadly with mixed up samples before study entry in Kenya a few years ago uh, and the, um, the bottom end here of, 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 of truly normal males actually having um, relatively little if, if any um, red cell mass loss but it's the, the, the corridor of uncertainty if you will here with these females that, that, um, that you need to define and so you, you, you need to define where is, it, where, do, where is it safe above which to dose? Where, is it, you know, where does risk and benefit balance out the, the risk of hemolysis and red cell loss with the benefit of not having repeated episodes of, of Vivax? And then dose, if you fix that, let's say 50%, you know, the more that you have in terms of dose, and I showed you from 900 milligram dose, uh, um, you know, good going hemoglobin loss, then if you fix the dose, if you fix the G6PD level, how do you then work out actually if there's a dose response in terms of um, um, the, the, the dose of drug that you're giving? So there's that multi-dimensional thing that in those women that are most at risk, you've got an increasing level of G6PD, but you've also got potentially the, the, the increasing dose. And so we did a study um, uh, with uh, uh, um, colleagues in, in Thailand, actually in, in May Sot, um, in, in, on, on the Western Thai border, um, and um, a, a gargantuan effort to identify G6PD heterozygous females with 40 to 60% activity. So finding those females who were A, 
uh, genetically heterozygous. That's not so difficult. There are about 18% of females within this particular Karen community there um, um, will have G6PD, so about 20% of the women. It's always difficult to get women into studies because they're actually uh, uh, harder to recruit um, than, than, than males. That's just a fact across all, 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 all clinical trials. Um, but also because there's variability, I said it's an enzymatic test, so there's an inherent variability in that, in the sense if I make you run the 100 metres three times, you'll do it in a slightly different time e each time, and that's no different for that, for that assay. Um, so um, a gargantuan effort to, to, to find and then dose those individuals and follow them for the um, uh, best part of 50 days to see what happens to their haemoglobin. And I've, I've just chosen two representative subjects to try to, 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 to highlight the fact that um, the data that we had showed that um, you, you clearly get um, uh, hemolysis with this drug. That's similar to um, what we know happens with primaquine, dosed daily. That's not single dose, that's continually dosed. Um, uh, uh, bilirubin not desperately sensitive when you're looking for laboratory evidence of, of, of hemolysis, um, but, but certainly reticulocytosis is a good measure of of the fact that there is some red cell loss in, in those individuals. All, all of the individuals dose actually stayed clinically um, uh, really very, uh, uh, very well, despite actually losing two to three grams of haemoglobin, and that's that risk benefit. But these are healthy volunteers. These aren't subjects with malaria, with other uh, morbidities. Here's the dose response, as I'm telling you, and you can see the difference between the green and the red line gets bigger as you get um, uh, 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 increase the dose of, um, of, of, of tofenoquine, the drug that we work on, and then you have to think whether that, that curve is, is similar to that, you know, five individuals, three individuals, and then you're making um, large investment decisions on that, large decisions on the safety of subjects, so not, not easy to, to, to understand how to take that forward in terms of being the clinician on one side, uh, understanding the need that there's a, a big gap in terms of being able to treat Vivax, but actually um, going into the phase three studies with relatively few data points um, is not, not, not easy decisions to, to take people through, um, particularly when, you know, if you get it wrong, then, then that can look um, very bad in terms of um, uh, the external interpretation of, of what you're trying to do. Um, interestingly, again, very small numbers. When you look um, in and around our chosen cutoff, uh, some might say relatively conservative. Um, you're not that interested in the median change in individuals. That's very interesting as a number. It's actually these outliers. So here's an individual dose of 200 milligrams that, that had 3.1 gram decline in hemoglobin from, from baseline. And then we can get into endless debates about is it the absolute decline, is it the starting level, and so on. All we can do is show you in healthy volunteers that, that that's what we've, that's what we've uh, ascertained, that there is probably a relationship between um, activity, so greater than 70, less than 70, not unsurprisingly, you, you get more hemoglobin loss. Um, and interestingly, if you're genetically normal to that higher level, although it's a little bit more variable, really you're seeing similar changes, a little bit of uh, wave around the baseline and noise. Um, so we then... Um, uh, undertook a dose ranging study, so we took subjects with uh, Vivax, um, everybody got chloroquine, uh, it's double dummy, which means everybody received tofenoquine, everyone received primaquine, but we had some people receiving double placebo, some people receiving placebo of tofenoquine and primaquine actively, and then four doses of, um, of tofenoquine with a, a, a more than tenfold change between those two, and that's, that's your dose ranging study. Um, and uh, what, what we showed was, in essence, so all of these people dosed with chloroquine alone. What was very interesting is that, that so, so this shows you the, the burden of disease. This is quite an interesting epidemiologic fact. So 60% of people, when followed up just for six months, got a second episode of malaria. So if you just treat people with chloroquine like they do with Ethiopia, um, uh, you know, um, somewhere along the line of half of your individuals will have another episode of malaria without needing to be rebitten by another mosquito. And so that, you know, and if you go to areas of um, Papua New Guinea and, and Indonesia and places like that, th these, these people from a very young age are having repeated episodes of diseases six to 12 weeks apart. That leads to chronic anemia. Uh, colleagues that I've worked with in India see people with high output <coughs> cardiac failure because of, the, because of the anemia that is in part at least driven by this recurrent disease. 
diet, worms, etc. Um, so, so that's the kind of that's the problem, um, and that that's the current solution, which is even within a, uh, a controlled clinical trial. It's not directly observed therapy, but believe you me, our excellent study staff made it very clear that people had to take that medicine. Um, you get a a 23% failure of of the currently um, um, uh, used drug. Uh, we noted, um, um, at least from an absolute value, these are um, uh, comparisons to the chloroquine only arm. Uh, uh, really reasonable efficacy with with tofenoquine. Why don't I say excellent efficacy? It probably is. Uh, we can't quite understand why these individuals failed. Was it because the drug failed, or was it because they're reinfected? It's another lecture in its entirety to, to look at that. I've got one slide on that. So that's the Kaplan-Meier again. Um, you can see that very quickly the chloroquine uh, failures. So, okay, so what can I tell you about you people seeing individuals coming back from endemic areas? Um, um, that, that actually once the chloroquine has, has worn off, uh, really people start to relapse. And it, it seems to be a relatively, uh, relatively steady rate, um, certainly early on. Um, and then there's a nice dose response, and these are the two higher-end doses of, of, of the drug that, that we're developing. Uh, and primaquine sits some, somewhere in the middle, and ignore that. That's a statistical blipper to do with sense, censoring people. So um, we did then look at... Um, so, so some of you say, well, why can't you work that out with genetics? Genetics seems to solve everything these days, and it, it kind of does. It's quite, it's quite interesting if you look here... Um, this is looking um, using microsatellite markers between um, uh, baseline sample and those, sample, those samples in those individuals that relapsed um, and saying, uh, was the baseline sample uh, actually the same as the, the relapsing samples? The first thing that you find is actually people often have more than one genotype um, circulating at baseline. Um, they often only have one relapsing at, um, uh, uh, circulating at relapse, but it is... Um, relatively inexact science using microsatellite markers compared to using either whole genome sequencing or barcode sequencing, which is probably what people are going to use in the future. But it's a relatively blunt tool. But the nice thing about the blunt tool is within the context of a clinical trial, actually um, you have those different arms and they're very, um, very clearly it's a randomized way. And therefore, if you see those differences, you can potentially uh, draw some conclusions from that. So we found the chloroquine arm, you get reasonably similar numbers of, 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 of heterologous and homologous relapses. Um, with, uh, if I just try and, try and convince you that when, when you um, use the, I had to um, combine the two, the, two do, the two doses, 300 and 600 together, but because the numbers are so small, but you seem to get a reversal of that pattern certainly get it with primaquine as well. So the pattern is that when, when you have ineffective treatment, you get um, a more homologous than heterologous relapse, but it does appear at least that effective atomenoquinoline treatment um, suppresses at least those homologous relapses. The implication being that at least some of these might be new infections. It's a very <coughs> genetically diverse <laughs> disease. Um, most of the background studies show you know, between 10 and 30 strains um, going within um, uh, communities at any one time. It depends on the endemicity and so on. So that, that's quite an interesting emerging area of how we might use um, PCR. Uh, it's very different to falciparum where it's very clear you can correct for underlying uh, reinfection. Not, not that straightforward in, in, um, in Vivax. So back to... Um, uh, the, the development plan, so I've shown you those two. We also did, a, and I didn't even tell you about the fact that we did a 260 patient, multi-million pound phase one study just looking at whether the QTC and other aspects of the ECG change or not. Just done that, okay? That's not even um, uh, worth reporting on, on you today. But, you know, I think you have to understand, you know, what the regulators are asking for, for the drug, and that's before we even get into phase, th phase three. So where are we now? Uh, we're doing a an efficacy study, very similar to that six-arm study, but just with three arms. Uh, we're doing a safety study looking particularly at hemoglobin changes because obviously that's our critical safety um, uh, uh, analyte of interest. And um, 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 we're also, for those of you that follow the kind of chloroquine resistance in Vivax, uh, certainly in uh, probably all parts of the world now there's chloroquine resistance um, and trying to future-proof the medicine, if you will. We're doing a drug-drug interaction study, 120 patients, 
um, in the US, again, healthy volunteers looking at whether um, the levels of uh, two ACTs change when co-dosed with, um, with, uh, with tofenoquine. So um, that's already a forearm study. If we did every single ACT, it would be you know, six, seven, eight times two, and that's not possible. So you have to make some kind of uh, uh, informed but um, uh, choices about which ACTs to look at. Uh, and there's this um, arrow here, which is as yet undefined, but is the, is, uh, this will lead to registration in Australia and America, and obviously that's not going to have much of an impact for those of you that have seen subjects with FIVAX. Generally, they don't come from those two countries. Um, uh, in addition, we need to get a, uh, some kind of glucometer to measure G6PD. We need to make people use that. We need to make it available so that they can use it, you know, not two chairs on the floor in an empty room. Um, and if we're going to do anything of any value, we need to uh, give you some kind of um, dosing regimen in children, which is, which is uh, a whole new um, uh, discussion in, it, in itself. In addition, uh, the, regi the, the regulatory environment in countries is changing all the time. It's very set in the EU and in, a, in the US. Uh, Australia, Canada, Japan, but actually in endemic markets, it's, you know, what you do today may not be what they want in two years' time. And so that's actually very difficult to try and best guess what um, individual countries will want in terms of the data um, for um, registration in those countries. So that's kind of uh, what we're doing um, in the, the day job. I thought I'd just take you through how we work and a few other kind of operational difficulties and, and, and things that we have. Uh, and then finish up um, in about, where's Phil, uh, t 10 minutes, 5, 10 minutes, if that's yeah. okay. Yes, just stop me droning on in a minute. Um, uh, okay, so, so we work in collaboration with the Medicines for Malaria Venture. They get money from DFID, from Gates, from other philanthropic um, governments. They're based in Geneva. Um, they have about 50 projects, but they have 50 employees. So you can see that the majority of the um, medicines development um, uh, um, team and the, the clinical team, I lead this clinical team, uh, uh, come mainly from, from GSK, but we get our, uh, uh, um, to a certain extent, funding and also, uh, to a certain extent, expertise from, uh, from colleagues in Geneva. Um, and so you're immediately working in partnership with people, so you're working with a completely different institution. So if you thought it was difficult to get someone transferred to another NHS ICU, you can kind of see um, that, that some, you know, you, you will always have people thinking that things need to be done in a different way, and it's how you collaborate and how you work together. And I was quite taken by Ewan's comment around uh, building a team and working with a team, and, and that's absolutely vital, and I think... Um, sorely missing, actually, in, in, in medical education at, at your level, actually, from my experience, which is uh, a few years ago. Um, yeah, so next steps, um, we need something like this, but this is obviously um, in a South African pharmacy. Uh, this is about £10. Um, so if we can do something like this, um, and actually, interestingly, the way you measure glucose, to a certain extent, is relatively similar to the way that you measure G6PD, as soon as you get electrons um, moving, you can actually measure that current, and that can give you that. that that's often um, um, linear in the bit that you're interested in. So we work with um, a number of very innovative biotechs and uh, uh, and also big companies in the uh, in the diagnostic space. That's not what the company I work for is particularly historically very um, very strong on, and so that's very interesting. That's a, a separate set of, of alliances, if you will. Again, funding from DFID and funding from Gates um, with a completely different set of people, a, a group called PATH um, based in Seattle, uh, an amazing, amazing um, institution which I um, strongly urge you go and look at their website when you think about what kind of research you want to do. They do amazing things and they're really, um, really uh, 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 interesting group of people to, to work with. Um, and then we work with regulatory agencies, so you don't see any of this. Um, you just get to prescribe the medicine, but the interaction between um, people that work in the FDA, um, we're not actually working with the European Medicines Agency who are based in um, Canary Wharf and represent the 27, 28 states of, uh, of the European Union, but we have um, meetings with them probably every couple of years. Um, we've met with India and Ethiopia and we're planning Indonesian um, regulatory meetings. Um, the clinical bit, me, colleagues is very central to that trying to get that message across about what you're doing why you're doing it why those data 
um, are important for registration of your drug in their, cu in their country. Um, we have a number of uh, interesting, we have orphan drug registration, which is really for rare diseases, but because Vivax is very rare in the US, we, we qualify for that. But more interestingly is we've got something called breakthrough therapy designation, and that gives us a much, um, much easier and more um, two-way interaction with the FDA in terms of here's our study design. Often you'll have to wait six weeks, they'll come back. You can hopefully get um, a much more interactive um, uh, environment with, with that particular regulatory agency. I didn't put on here um, um, Australian TGA, very important in terms of uh, our ability to then um, uh, market, um, register in endemic markets. I think you saw the, uh, the issue. So um, what you're trying to do here is, is, is collect data that proves that, um, that, 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 that the medicine works and then register the medicine. Um, and I think many of you may have been involved in clinical trials of one scripture and you've done a review of notes, you've done audit, things. What you don't have is, is the, the US regulators then coming and checking what you've done. Okay, so um, Vivax is a disease of poverty. It it's really is... Um, a rural disease, rural peri-urban disease. This is um, uh, some work. So I know there's somebody from Chittagong has been to Chittagong. This is in Bandraban. The, these are the kind of wards that your patients will be going in. If you can think about your NHS wards, that's the kind of wards where clinical trials are done for asthma and so on and so forth. Um, this is the, the, the research building. You've got a Land Rover, but actually it's got a Toyota engine because the Land Rover engine blew up. Uh, this is your research nurse, but she's also actually doing routine clinical care. This is funded by um, intermittent um, philanthropic funding. It's not funded by the government. That's your way into getting your patients, but your study is, you know, two years to recruit plus six months to follow up. Will they still be there? And that goat um, is waiting for an outpatient appointment. Um, and sometimes you get cows on the first floor of the hospital because in Bangladesh, a cow is sacred and you can't shoo him out of the... He or, he or her out of the uh, out of the hospital, uh, but equally you have to create data that is absolutely watertight. When the auditors come, it really is what um, what they found at the time when that patient. So um, I think that's that's kind of where I've finished. I think somebody asked, you know, what do you do as a as a you know you now? I think most of you think that I give out tourniquets and post-it notes. Um, <laughs> you'll be pleased to know I won't be offering you those today, but. Um, you know, actually, what do I do during the day? Uh, actually, I've got three slides on what I've done in the last couple of weeks. Uh, it's a bit more like, um, like this when we're recruiting. Um, but essentially, am I still a doctor? I think that I can justify to you that I still am. This is a patient in the US. Nice ECG, nice normal axis and sinus rhythm. Um, I can't remember how old they are. Uh, um, their, their ventricular rate's 50. And that is not because the leads fell off, all right? That, 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 that patient was dosed with... Um, so the first thing is they may be in a blinded study, so you've absolutely no idea whether they're receiving your investigational product or not. And then you receive a call at 10 o'clock at night, and so what are you going to do? You've got 10 people coming in the next day. Are you going to dose them or are you not going to dose them? Um, and um, so uh, the good thing about telemetry is you can kind of see them slowing down. The drug that they were taking actually has a bradycardia on the label, um, and they're certainly bradycardic. Um, <laughs> somewhere in here they got a bit of CPR, um, and then um, they obviously um, got spontaneous r r uh, sinus rhythm back. So. It's taken a while to drive into <coughs> <laughs> uh, so that's the, that's the first patient that, that I thought I'd show you. Diagnosis. Drug reaction. Come back to that. Yeah. Okay, faint. Okay? <laughs> How many people faint with ECG leads on? If you get enough people in a trial, somebody will have a vasovagal. So this patient probably had a, may have had a slightly longer period of... Um, of, of, of of, of asystole than you'd expect, but I suspect not many of you have actually monitored someone when they faint. You might feel their pulse. It's a bit sweaty and so on. I'm sorry, but they, so someone faxes that over to you, not to say what shall I do with this patient, you can live a away, but 
Yeah. Well, both actually. So, so um, we use electronic mail now rather than faxes. Um, uh, 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 and the Adobe works quite well on my computer. So, um, so, so you get sent that, and it's you know we've got ten more people coming in tomorrow. Then you've got people breathing down your neck. Don't slow this down. You know we need this drug. There's people with malaria need the medicine. But you're like the kind of consult person. No, the consult person's the cardiologist. Okay, uh, and the issue for me is not how to manage this patient because fortunately they need investigations now. Yeah, yeah they need an echo and blah blah. blah. It's, it's do you dose? Do you carry on dosing? Do you actually delay the study by two three weeks? Do you lose your slot in the phase one unit, which means you wait another two months before you can start to get people back in? How do you explain those delays because someone fainted? Because actually, ultimately, that's what the diagnosis is. So that that's the the kind of consultatory. I, I can't be the patient's physician, no, although it's quite interesting. Yeah. That grey area, they don't always see that like that. What do you want us to do? Well, I think you should do a 20 or 4 hour tape. I think you should do an echo. Yeah. What about this patient? This is actually last night. Night before last. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think we, sh do you think we should stop dosing in this subject? <laughs> Drug reaction. What are you going to do with this patient? Anybody got a doctors.org doc email address? Anybody know Neil Bacon? He's a CEO now. The lime green jelly test. What's the lime green jelly test? Yeah, this patient's brushing their teeth. All right? This patient was brushing, brushing their teeth. Well, there's another one. I couldn't be bothered this morning, but there's another one where it's all that, actually. All right? But, but yeah, brushing their teeth. Um, what else? Last one. Uh, this may be all you get. So what are you going to do with this subject? Same study, actually. Uh, ALT um, in this individual um, went from 20 up to 236. Diagnosis? Sorry? Alcohol? Maybe. They're in a phase one unit, so probably they'd have been celebrating before they came in. But, okay. So, yeah, alcohol, anything else? Been dosed with? Artemethylumophantrin, I think, actually. Nothing? You're not going to say anything? No differential? Drug-induced Drug induced. Thank you very much. You walked into my trap. Very good. Okay. So, um, you know, that, that, that's what they say. They ring up. This patient's got a liver event. A liver event like this, asymptomatic subject, high rise in ALT. Let's assume this patient was on an investigational drug is a big thing. Okay, you see it, flicker, oh, no, no, no. just do it again, two days time, houseman, you know, do it again. In fact, don't do it, then no one will know. Um, it's, a big, it's a big problem because it's the harbinger of fulminant hepatic failure. So the more patients you have with asymptomatic rises in ALT above three times upper limit of normal, the more chances are you're a predictor of somebody eventually dosing enough. Remember, you only dose a few hundred before you go into phase phase three and may only dose a few thousand before you go into the marketplace, that's a, a harbinger of fulminant um, hepatic failure. So do you stop dosing? Is that the end of that drug? It, it, if you get somebody who gets bilirubin above two times normal and ALT above three times normal, actually it often is. Uh, there's a drug called Maraviroc and GSK were um, um, uh, uh, hot on the heels of that and um, uh, uh, that that drug uh, be, be, uh, had two two events like that, and the drug was was the, the development of that drug was stopped. Okay, so um, I'm going to take credit for this because it was the test that I ordered. So this individual had um, CPK, not on our usual battery of tests for that study of 50,000, and that's just a, 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 a side effect, really, if you will, of of the high CPK, um, and. Um, uh, Often these individuals um, are fit, young, healthy males and they get trapped in the internal unit for a few days and they go out and they go to the gym and they go for a run and do some weights. And, uh, that's not un unusual for us. Okay, so I'll, I'll stop there. Um, we know that atamine and quinolines cause hemolysis in G6BD deficient subjects and because we're now met, trying to develop a drug in the modern world, can't quite take the same approach as happened with brimaquin. Uh, understanding those hemoglobin designs is, is, it declines is very important. Um, we're using that, that dose, which you think is probably right for the risk-benefit. 
Uh, we definitely need some kind of point of care test, which is a whole different discussion in terms of how you might actually make that happen in the real world uh, with two chairs in an empty room. Um, and I hope I've shown you that um, being a physician in, in, uh, in, um, in a pharmaceutical company does come with uh, clinical consequences. And I'll stop there.